<laughs> Thanks so much, Tina. Uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be back here at Stanford. Uh, I spent a wonderful summer here in 1995, perhaps before a number of you were born. And uh, I really do consider sort of Stanford as, as, uh, as uh, my alma mater. Um, so thanks for having us. Uh, me, I'm Al, that's Dave, and the uh, good looking ball guy here is Christopher, and he's the third partner of Play Bigger. And we are category designers. And we're going to talk a lot about category design today as a discipline. But our hunch is, is that in this room today, there's a number of category designers. Many of you as entrepreneurs are probably category designers, you just don't know it just yet. And so we want to start with sort of a simple thought, which is that essentially every product or company that we really love um, exists because of one thing, and that one thing is a legendary entrepreneur created a great product, a great company, and a great category all at the same time. And we call this the magic triangle. It's this thing that uh, enduring companies really do, which is to have a product, product design, capability and discipline, a company design piece, and a category design piece. They're the three pillars of what we call enduring companies. And many of you are already studying a number of these particular disciplines right now, uh, especially in the computer science faculty. So agile development is very much something that plays in the product design side of the house. Um, Growth hacking is something that happens definitely on the company design side in the sense of sales and marketing distribution. Um, and so you're already sort of learning capabilities in those two buckets. But we're here to talk to you about the third pillar of building an enduring company, which is called category design. And one of our favorite um, category designers is a fellow by the name of Clarence Birdseye. And Clarence was born in the 20s in the United States, and in his earlier years, he spent time up in the northern states. And he had this observation, which was the Eskimos would fish, they would bring the fish out of the water, drop it onto the ice, ice water bond, flash freezes the, the fish, and then they would take those fish back to their homes, and they would consume those fish over a period of a week, a month, or a year. Uh, so long as it stayed frozen, when you defrosted, if you like, that fish, it was as fresh as it was when it started. So that was his insight. That was the thing that he kind of figured out. And of course, in the 20s, um, you know, there wasn't the plethora of opportunity you have to have fresh foods as we do today. If you live near a farm, you probably went to a market, and that was cool. You got fresh foods. Um, if you didn't, you probably ate canned foods. And so Clarence kind of railed this uh, whole uh, point of view around fresh. And he got out and started to talk about uh, the value of uh, fresh foods. Um, and if you think about it, that was the product side. That was the product design piece. He invented flash freezing. It was related to vegetables in that particular case. And um, he then had to convince all the trucking companies in the United States that they needed to take this frozen food from the farms, essentially, to the, to the supermarkets. And then he also had to convince the supermarkets that they should put freezers in. And of course, we walk into the supermarkets today, and this is what we see. This is called a frozen food aisle. In it, you have frozen vegetables, which is what bird's eye is famous for, but you've got pretty much everything else. And so he was a genius at creating, doing product design, company design, and category design to the extent that we all now experience it basically 100 years later, and there's a plethora of, of, of foods that are available. And if you look at, you probably can't read the numbers, but I can just tell you this is, the lifetime value of this category is probably about a trillion dollars already. And so that when you become the leader in a particular uh, category, you do create a ton of value. And so one of the things that we did, and when I say we, it was <laughs> more me than, 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 than Dave, was to really, and that's because I do math and Dave doesn't do math, he does the, the genius on the marketing side. Um, we did a bunch of research here uh, around this whole notion of category. It's new and it's something that's really topical at the moment. And we invested quite a lot of time and energy and Clarence was one of the examples on the qualitative side of the research. We interviewed more than 100 of the great leaders of technology companies in the United States. 
Uh, we did a whole bunch of reviews around that, which led to what Dave's going to talk about in a little bit, which is what we call the category design playbook, which is how do you do category design? If it's a new discipline, what are the things that you need to do to ultimately become what we call the category king? And then on the other side, we did a bunch of quantitative research, and this quantitative research looked at every single company founded since 2000, US-based with VC backing. And if you do that, you'll find that there's about 8,000 companies that fall into that bucket, of which about 850 plus or minus uh, are involved in an M&A transaction. That's their exit, if you like. That's the way they uh, create the value. 75 of them actually make it to being public companies. And so these are the two uh, aspects we want to talk to you today, is sort of some of our findings related to this research. And we want to start by giving you sort of what we would call is the cliff notes of category design. Uh, and there's five things we want to talk to you about. The first one is, this is very much, the technology industry is very much a winner-take-all industry. And in fact, in our research, which we did, it was called the Time to Market Research. It's available on playbeaker.com slash research. If you want to have a look at it, it was uh, about 18 months ago that we first sort of discovered this, that if you take a look at the market cap of the category kings, relative to everybody else in that field of 8,000 companies. There are 35 category kings, and they represent 76% of the market cap of the, uh, the tech space. And if you're the category king, that is the one that leads in the space, you take 76% of the market cap of the category. Think frozen foods, lifetime value 100 years. It's not market share, market cap. So 76% goes to the winner. And there's, in, in this particular research, might be a little difficult to see, but there are three cohorts, three eras as we call them, and it's pretty, pretty much between 71, 72, and 79. In the middle cohort, Facebook existed, and so it distorts it a little bit. But 76%, so remember that. The winner takes all, it's 76%. The second thing is, is that we discovered that cat categories themselves actually have a natural life cycle. And the natural life cycle looks like this. We call it the category life cycle model. And on the x-axis, the horizontal axis here, you've got time. And what you're looking at in that graphic there is about 15 years, plus or minus. And I'll show you some little bit more detail on the, on the timing here. But it's plus or minus 15 years. And on the y-axis, the vertical axis, it's the market cap of that entire category. So think every single company in the CRM category, for example, add up the market caps of all of those companies. That is the category uh, value. And what happens is... Categories in the first phase kind of, uh, this is probably duh, but it starts out really slow and it takes a while for a category to really pick up. Then in the middle phase it accelerates really quickly and then it'll drop off towards it once the category becomes really mature. Nothing super exciting in that graphic. You've probably seen something like that before in the form of a bell curve, but if you relate it over time it looks like this. The exciting thing was a guy called Paul Gorowski um, wrote a book and he talks about the number of what he calls providers explodes in the early phase of a category and then ultimately drops off over time. And if you think about what's happening here, it makes sense that the, in the early stage, lots of competition, not a lot of value in the category itself. In the middle phase, competitors are dropping off, the category's really taking off, and in the end phase, one company takes 76% of the market share. That's what we call the category lifecycle model. The third thing we wanted to do was we looked at those 75 companies that did go public and we wanted to know was there something related to age in those public companies. And it turns out that companies that go public when they're somewhere between 6 and 10 years of age are the ones that create all of the value. This is the cohort from 2000 onwards. And we've looked back, uh, already started to look back, back through to... The, uh, the 80s, and it seems to hold. And Harvard Business Review just ran a big study on this, actually based off of our research. It's in the latest version of the Harvard Business Review. And here's what we found. This is what we call the 610 law. And it is on the x-axis again. You've got the years. And then we've binned all of the companies into years. So all of the companies at, for example, age 7 uh, created that amount of value in billions. And the way that we measured that was the day after they went public, we looked at what their price was, we looked at it what it is today, so the value created since public offering is what you're looking at. 
And so you can see that companies that go public too early pretty much crater. Companies that go public too late are kind of yawners, right? That there's nothing really happening out there. But this middle spot, this sweet spot, as we called it in the, IP, in the Harvard Business Review, is where all of the action is. And it started getting us to think, well, OK, so if age is the determinant, we also did something else you'll see in the Harvard Business Review, which is we tried to look at it based on the amount of money that a company had raised, and there is no correlation. So it's fascinating. There's no correlation as it relates to the amount of money you raise as a company, yet there is a relation as it relates to age. And it started us thinking about, well, what could possibly be driving that phenomenon? And it turns out that the phenomenon is when you lay these two charts over the top of each other, what you see is, is that the middle section, this developed phase of the, of the category life cycle curve, is where all of the value gets created. And it makes sense. These are all of the actual companies underneath that graphic that you can see. And it makes sense. And George Lee, who's from Goldman Sachs, sat down with us one time, took a look at this. For those of you who don't know George, he's the head investment banker there, so he does this for a living. And he said, that makes complete sense. That makes complete sense. And the reason is because you know, public investors are looking for two things. They're looking for growth, and they're looking for margin expansion or profitability. And if you think about it, during that middle phase, what's happening? Companies are growing really fast. The category's kind of exploding. And what else is happening? The number of competitors is disappearing, is dropping. So pricing pressure goes off. You can then increase your prices, ultimately increase your margins. So that's why this is happening. And the final thing is, on, just on category science, is, is that um, categories aren't static. They have these, tend to have these technology cliffs that, 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 uh, they can fall, that companies can fall off. In this particular case, this, this axis at the bottom is about 35 years that you're looking at. It's the CRM category, which stands for Customer Relationship Management. It's a very well-known category in technology. And the, winner, the current king of the CRM category is... Right, Salesforce. So, but it didn't start out like that. It actually started out as contact management. You folks weren't alive when this started. Many of you weren't, at least. We used to write paper cards. They were called filofaxes. I can see some of the folks in the audience smiling already. We used to take these paper cards and we'd write your name and address on them and we'd put them in a file that was a circular file. And when I wanted to call you, I would look up your name in the file. I would call you on a landline. That's how it went. Now, I know that's ridiculous for most of you in the room right now, but that's how it started. And then when the PC revolution came, what happened was a couple of companies, uh, um, ACT was one of them and Goldmine was the other, essentially automated your contacts. I know this doesn't sound dramatic for you folks in the room because you do it every day naturally on your iPhones, but they automated it. You then took all your file effects, put it into your PC, and they were your contacts. That was the contact management category. Relatively small, but it was the start of this journey. What then happened was people said, well, gee, if I've got my contacts in the computer, whenever I talk to somebody, why don't I just put notes associated with that so they know what's going on with my customers? And ultimately, the, the Salesforce automation phase of this story started to develop, and then ultimately, customer relationship management as a function took that plus a number of other things that you had to do with your customer, customer support, field support, all of those sorts of things, bundled it all together. A guy called Siebel, Tom Siebel. Put your hands up if you heard Tom Siebel's name. All right, so he was the guy in the middle of this pot, uh, and he drove this thing. His problem was, anyone know what Tom Siebel's problem was? I'll tell you what his problem was. They had on-premise software. It meant that the installations took a long time and were really hard to do. And actually, most of them actually never even happened. So along comes this guy called um, Mark Benioff and says, well, hey, we're going to do all that in the cloud. And he, took, he, he ate their lunch completely. And so CRM in the cloud, as we think of it today, does not have on-prem software. And you may not believe this, but on-prem software was not even a term that anyone invented. You know who invented that? Mark Benioff. Why? Because that was the bad thing over there called on-prem software. Cloud software was the good thing. And that you'll find as part of the category design things that Dave's going to be talking about, that's a lot of what you've got to do. You've got to position yourself. And of course, we think there's another um, era of innovation coming here, which we call mobile CRM. Um, and there's kind of an irony also here in the history of Microsoft and Apple. 
If you think about it, in the early 90s and the late 80s, Gates was the greatest category designer of all time. He created this PC operating system category, blew up, did an incredible job with the, with the, the Wintel consortium, took over the world, basically. And then he invented something called front office. There wasn't a front office until he invented it and created a set of software tools that you needed as a person, quote, in the front office. And that was called Microsoft Office. And then if you've got a front office, what else have you got? A back office. And so he created software for the back office. And this blue line represents the value that investors had in the categories that they developed. Uh, Gates went away, and Microsoft went nine eye. Along comes Apple, 98, the, quote, second coming of jobs. And um, he introduces digital music, completely revolutionizes that industry, iPhones and iPads, and you know that story. And again, the yellow line up here represents what's happened with Apple stocks still. So it shows you that when you're a great category designer, when you build product, company, and category together, you can create immense value. And if you're not creating these categories, and you're not in tune with how this plays out over time, you're going to end up like the blue line. Okay, so that's the category science. I'm going to quickly take you through some brain science. This is really, some really advanced stuff that's been done uh, in this part of the world about why we make the decisions we do when we're making purchase decisions, because in the end, businesses ultimately get driven by purchase decisions or choices to use something, in the case of Facebook, its usage. And its first thing is, is to know is, is that you might think this is not true, but it is, which is companies don't live in space. They don't live over there or down the road. They actually live here, in between your ears. They live in your mind. And we've only got certain capacity inside of this CPU up here, and so we need ways to organize all of these companies. And that's called a container, and that container is actually a category. And so, you know, my friend rang me the other day and said, hey, listen, I know there's some snow coming to Tahoe. Uh, I'm flying in from Australia. Um, I need to get from San Francisco to Tahoe. What should I do? My answer was, go rent an SUV. What's an SUV? It's a category, right? I didn't tell him which particular type of car. I just gave him a bucket and said, go, go get one of those. Go ask for one of those. And categories work because it's kind of the way our brain works. We like to have a filing system. We want to put all of the different brands and, and products and companies into that filing system. And ultimately, it's the way people discover uh, products and services is via this concept of a category. And categories actually manifest everywhere. You just, you, ha you may not have thought about it like this. When you walk into a supermarket, that's what you see. What is the sign above the aisle? The category definitions. It's all of the soaps, detergents, right? So it, it's, it's a way of organizing. And if you think for one second that this is a random assortment of products on shelves and that the store's not organized for a particular way, you're crazy. The milk's always at the back of these places, right? Why? You've got to move past all the other categories to get there because they know that's one of the things you're coming in. So categories have been an organizing principle, time immemorial. And they also true in the tech space. This is, a, this is a famous Luma chart for big data landscape in 2015. It makes, it, it makes my head hurt just looking at it. But what are those boxes? Those boxes are categories. Someone has gone through all of the companies in the big data space and said, hey, that's one of these companies, that's one of those companies. And when people start to think about, well, what do I need for my business? They start to think about, okay, I need one of those boxes. And then they'll start to choose underneath that the, the company. And so let's talk about what happens in our natural world today. We get more than 10,000 marketing messages every single day. We are swamped with stuff coming at us, and we're very much in an overstimulated society right now. And so you can't make a decision about any one of those boxes quickly. You just can't. And so what happens is our brain uses a shortcut system. It starts it starts narrowing down and speeding up the way in which we make these decisions. And the, the, the research here calls them cognitive biases. Many of you have probably already heard of them. But it's not about logic. It's actually about instincts. And I want to talk to you about three really important um, biases that you should know as a category designer. And the first one is the anchoring effect. If I said to you, hey, listen, you want to buy my car? And you said, sure. 
And, you, and I said, well, it's $5,000. That's an anchoring statement. It's not 50, it's not two, it's five, and now we're negotiating on the margin. That's what great category designers do. They get out into the market, they anchor the conversation around what we call their point of view. Right? The world now comes to you. It's a $5,000 thing. It's not a 50 or a million dollar thing. The second thing is groupthink. You folks live in this world every day. When you turn on your social machines, what's happening? You're getting groupthink back to you. If Dave likes a certain beer or he likes a certain type of snowboard, it's more than likely I'm going to like that snowboard or that beer too because just because he's a buddy of mine and I respect him. And that's why Facebook and advertising on Facebook is going off the charts, right? It's because groupthink and the ability to influence those people in your circle is actually more powerful than anything else other than word of mouth in, in, in person. Then the final thing is once you make a decision to purchase something, it's called choice supportive bias. Once I buy a particular brand, I end up kind of loving that brand forever. And even though it might not be better and someone markets me a better feature, I don't care. I'm in love with this thing. And so these things play a very important role as you go to market. And category designers actually use these brain shortcuts uh, as part of the category design process to lead people to purchase decisions or usage. So it turns out if you go back to that slide which had the 610 law, it turns out that the category growth actually is determined by how fast our brains can change. And if you peel back underneath that 610 law and you said, hey, what do the consumer companies do compared to the enterprise companies? The answer is, is the consumer companies are all down the six year, six year end of the, of the spectrum, the enterprise companies at the 10, because it's one thing to say, hey, would you like to learn how to use Pinterest or Facebook? It's not a huge decision for you. It's an incredible capability. It's another thing if I'm the IT director of Wells Fargo and you said, hey, I've got a new computer, you want to try it out and run your system. This just takes longer. And so how quickly we can convince someone that they should use this or buy that is actually the determinant of how fast these companies grow, especially in this uncertain world. And in our belief, that's why conditioning the mind is actually your number one priority as an entrepreneur and as a CEO. This is your job. In addition to product design, yep, that's hard. You've got to get the product market fit, and there's a whole bunch of techniques you're using to do that. In addition to company design, sales, distribution, culture, uh, and all of the other things that you need to build a great company, you also have to build a great category. Because if you don't and you're not the category king, you'll be fighting over the scraps. You'll be fighting over the 26% the, the, the that's left for number two through number 10. So with that in mind, I'd like to invite my partner Dave up, who's going to start to talk to you about conditioning the mind and the new discipline of what we call category design. All right. Thanks, Al. I'm Dave. Um, thank you for having us today. So Al mentioned we have done the research and we created a playbook. And I'd say we didn't really create the playbook. This playbook is something that we have been researching and studying through our 20-year careers as operators. This playbook emerged from all, certainly all the research in the hundreds of companies that we've spoke with uh, for many of the different uh, things that we're working on and obviously all the clients we've ever worked with. And it was sort of we thought it would be fun today if we could sort of unlock some of the secrets that these category kings were using to become the kings of their category in these enduring companies that we all read about. So one of the most common things when you think about these uh, category kings and these, uh, the development of uh, categories we all enjoy today is these designers take us on a journey. And one of the things, that it's kind of a, a trick. I think most of the time you don't hear about the king or the leader of the category until it springs on you. I mean, first time you see Pinterest, it's you know, millions of people are using it. First time you hear about Uber, there's Uber uh, vehicles all over the city. So you kind of hear about it late and you feel it late. But the reality, these journeys are hard. They don't happen overnight. There's teams of people working very, very hard to kind of bring what they see in their heads into, and turn it into a great product and a great company. And one of the uh, companies that we did a lot of research on, we wanted to kind of unlock the, the kings. You know, what happened? What's the story behind the story? And this is not our graphic, but it's a great thing. You can Google the Airbnb story. Hear what happened. And one of the big ahas uh -huh for me, and I didn't realize this, is did anybody know where the Air and Airbnb came from? Air mattress. Yeah, three of them. 
right? And they rented them for 80 bucks. And what else? Where'd the breakfast come from? Right, and they advertised three beds and breakfast for 80 bucks, and three people showed up, and that insight <laughs> led to a very long path to what we now consider a brand new alternative in our life. That alternative is another thing, as Al said, another place to go, another choice when you go visit, or actually now when you go live in another city, in somebody else's home or somebody else's room. And that's Airbnb, and they created this category of private hospitality. It started with three air mattresses. Long journey. So what we wanted to do is share a little bit about that journey. Again, we'll try to pull all this into the next 20 minutes, but believe me, if you're an entrepreneur and you ever walk down this path, it could take years, in some case decades, to really see the fruits of all this labor. So when you look at categories, the one thing, again, they all have in common is they start with an insight. That aha moment. And I'm guessing many of you have already had that aha moment and you're staying up late at night or talking to your friends or maybe not telling any of your friends. <laughs> right? You don't want them to know. And that aha moment, actually, Anne Mirako, our, our partner over at uh, Floodgate, she calls that the technology or market insight. And it starts there. And once you have that aha and you basically haven't slept, and you've been kind of using all your classwork to fill in all the blanks and how to create a great company or a great uh, product, one of the toughest things to do is answer one of the most simple questions, which is, this insight I have, what problem does it solve? And can I explain this problem? And have people understand it like I was explaining it to a five-year-old. And it's an interesting question. We have seen companies and worked with companies that have been wrestling with this question for years. The problem with answering this question is a whole bunch of other questions come up. If, I'm, if I have this insight, is my insight solving a problem that's an existing problem with a really crappy answer, which is, in this case, if you think about Uber, you know, taxis could get you from point A to point B but they kind of smelled funny and they were unreliable and unsafe? Or am I trying to convince people of a brand new problem they didn't even know they had? And I think Airbnb is a good example. I don't think anybody thought there was a crisis in the hospitality industry and we needed to stay in somebody else's home. I don't think there was you know, a big, big uh, uh, dilemma there, but they convinced us. They conditioned us to understand there's another alternative. And the list of problems go on and on and on and on. And these could keep entrepreneurs up at night. But understanding the problem is the first step because as soon as you ask what the problem is, the second question is, what is your secret sauce for solving that problem? What is the answer? And again, is it a market insight? Did something happen? Broadband back in the day opened up social media, and, uh, and, and today marketplaces can be literally invented overnight, connecting supply and demand. Did something happen in the market that allowed you to take advantage and capitalize and create a new company or a new product? Or again, is that that tech insight? Uh, we did a lot of work with, uh, around Diane Green and what happened at VMware. And she's very humble. <laughs> she would say, oh, we just accidentally created the whole virtualization category. I don't believe that. They're way too smart. But there was a technology there. They didn't know, understand what problem it was solving. And so my guess is, if you're in this room, there's a, probably a lot of plutonium creators a lot of answers, a lot of products get created without a full understanding of where the problem is. You know, there's old cliche technology looking for a problem. And the only, I'd, I'd say this, if you don't remember anything else that Al and I talk about, <laughs> and you're running around with your new product, your new tech insight, take one second, slow down, and think about the problem you're trying to solve with that technology. And believe me, people will understand what you see a lot better and they'll understand the value of your product if you just slow down and understand that problem statement first. So we thought we'd have a little fun. Again, we do a lot of research, and I'm kind of a category geek, so I'm always thinking about whenever I see a company. I saw a new company today. It was called um, it was On Demand Gasoline. What was it called? Uh, oh, uh, fill it fill, or something like that. And I was like, is there, yeah, filled, is there really a category where people need gas delivered? I, that's, I, that's the first question I ask. And what problem is that? I know I'm out of gas or low on gas, but how big could that possibly be? But anyway, every time I look at a company, I think about the problem they're solving. 
So here's a couple of uh, well-known insights, well-known problems, and they were solved. And the people who solved them are also extremely well-known. They built legendary enduring companies in huge categories, and you probably recognize some of them. Louder guitar, that was Les Paul. Right? I want to surf in cold water longer, that was Jack O'Neill, men in the wetsuit, which turned into a lifestyle brand. I already talked about stinky taxis. <laughs> the bottom one, though, here, uh, this, one is, this one sort of emerged. It was right in front of my face every time I uh, went shopping and kind of was driving in my car, and I didn't even realize it was a problem being solved, which is just because I'm tired doesn't mean I'm thirsty. Anybody have a guess what company is behind that? Five-hour energy. Just because I'm tired doesn't mean I'm thirsty. And if you read the story about how five-hour energy emerged, it was pretty classic. I'm tired. I don't want to drink coffee. I don't want to drink a giant can of yuck, <laughs> right? Red Bull or nitrous-powered Gatorade or any of that crap that, you know, you don't even know what you're drinking. In fact, I don't know what's in this five-hour energy either. <laughs> Actually, I had one right before I stepped up here, so that's, that explains a lot. But it's a pretty amazing uh, product insight. But it also led to a new category. And how do you know it's a new category? One of the tells is it's not stocked next to energy drinks. It's called an energy shot. And they put it at point of sales right before you leave Safeway. And they put it right next to the cigarettes in gas stations. It's a new category. It doesn't live next to energy drinks and Coca-Cola and coffee. A lot, of, uh, a lot of insights there. I hope those questions uh, maybe help you see the world through a different lens. But once you understand the problem and your answer, you've got to think of your name, right? <laughs> and one of our favorite questions to ask is, if you solve the problem that's been keeping you up at night perfectly, what category are you in? You know, are you a sea panda or are you a killer whale? I would rather be a killer whale. But if you think about category names, I think category naming has got a bad name. A lot of three-letter acronyms, right? and about sections inside of press releases. Nobody even knows where they come from, random BS generators, all that kind of stuff. But there is a science and a psychology behind this name. I'll mention the name of the game as this cognitive bias. How can you create a new space, a new drawer in the kitchen, a new, a new file in the uh, file server in your head to go to, to understand the value or what problem I'm solving with a particular product? That's what this category naming world does. It gives you a new place, an energy shot. There's a lot of uh, intuitive uh, work going around the name and why it's important and it needs to be functionally intuitive for users so they know exactly how often they're going to use your product every day. It has to be functionally intuitive for budgeting for CFOs. If it looks like something that lives in a budget, that's a good thing, if you're especially in the B2B space. But naming is a lot of art and a lot of science. And Al mentioned earlier on the CRM curves, these evolutions. And Mark Benioff is a master. He truly was. And I was around, I'm going to date myself too, when Mark Benioff and Salesforce came out and started talking about something called an ASP. And I remember I was working at Mercury Interactive, and we were making a lot of money testing failed Siebel implementations. That was our business. It was great. Siebel 7's coming. You're going to buy a lot of Mercury because you had to test that stuff, and it didn't really work that well. And Mark came out, and he didn't say, I have a better Salesforce automation tool than Tom Siebel. And if you have seen CRM, it's sort of like a funnel and a database, right? There's not a lot of depth in it. Instead, he said, I have something new. It's called an application service provider, ASP. Didn't even say cloud. It was a new delivery mechanism for software. And then he also had to do the hard, talk about Clarence Bird's eye, he was out there convincing Wall Street about something called software as a service. People are going to buy software differently. Before, you had to buy software in a perpetual license, so a perpetual license of Siebel could cost you $25 million up front, U.S. cash. Where Mark Benioff came out with Salesforce.com, and it was almost coin-operated. Put some money in, and out comes your uh, CRM. So think about that. He went from ASP, a new delivery category, SaaS, a new model, a new revenue model, and then ultimately that led to the cloud. 
and we'll talk more about what Mark did, to really, really stick it to all the folks in this world called on-premise, which he did invent that term. It was not called on-premise before uh, uh, Benioff came out and started sharing with the world a new alternative to software. And you can't talk about category design without mentioning Steve Jobs. And again, if you remember Al's chart, we saw what happened when Microsoft took their foot off the pedal and what happened when Steve came back to work. <laughs> and one of the great case studies we, we admire is what happened when Apple, and in particular Steve Jobs, launched the iPad. And I don't know if you remember, do you remember when Microsoft had that PC tablet thing? Didn't work that well. Newtons were early, right? They were a lot of failed attempts at this kind of thing in between a phone and a computer. But when Steve Jobs launched the iPad, he stood on stage and he said, there's a new category, a new place. Something that's not a phone and something that's not a computer. And it needs to be in your life creates more engagement than your Mac, uh, your computer, and it does a lot, has a lot more horsepower than your phone. He put that in our heads and made it okay to buy four or five billion dollars worth of that stuff. Right? It was not a coincidence. He didn't say, I got a brand new device and it's so much better than anything you've seen before. So you got your name, you got your problem, you got your plutonium. Now, how do you share with the world who else is participating in your category? One of the most common questions we hear, is there ever such thing as a category of one? It doesn't exist, because there's always an ecosystem. There's always a supply chain. There's always people, processes, and technologies required beyond your capabilities in your own company to fulfill the category promise, to solve the problem. No one company can solve that problem. And so a blueprint and ecosystem is a, is a way, call it your mall map, it tells you everything inside the category you need to solve and where we fit within that answer. And one of the best examples of this was what happened, I think it was last month at F8, where Mark Zuckerberg released the new ecosystem and blueprint for Facebook in the world of social media and communications. And what this blueprint does is a psychological, it has a huge psychological impact. Remember Al mentioned all those biases, anchoring effect, this is the new world. Right? And he led us inside his head. We didn't have to guess where we're going anymore. He said, this is exactly where we're going. We're here now, and there's a whole bunch of new stuff in Facebook that you're going to enjoy. Five years from now, you're going to see enhancements to all the stuff you're already enjoying today through video and messaging. And in the future, reach under your chairs, and you're going to find your new virtual reality set. We're going to live in a virtual world, augmented reality. He shared the world his, uh, his vision, his category, and now he's going to shepherd us along. And the feeling you have when you see this is enlistment. And that's what category designers do. They enlist you in a cause. So every category ha designer, the sp specifically the category kings that we know, and those entrepreneurs are kind of uh, you know, locked in our minds, has a point of view. And a point of view is often mistaken for messaging, or marketing, or even positioning. And it's all of those, but it's more and it's bigger than that. A point of view establishes what you stand for. It establishes what you stand against. It attracts the people you want to attract into your business, into your ecosystem, into your category. And it repels the people you don't want to do business with. And the point of view is built around a framework that's been around for a long, long time, framing the problem, painting clear ramifications for not solving that problem, sharing the vision for the future, and outlining the business outcomes and what to do now. So has anybody ever stayed up late and seen an infomercial? <laughs> like the Zumba, that, you know, that thing that crawls around on your floor and sweeps up everything? Have you ever noticed how infomercials start? Black and white. Right? It's always the problem. They frame the problem up front, and then it turns to vibrant colors, the vision for the future, and then operators are standing by. This framework is also, and I would say it used to be used in politics. Now they just yell at each other. But it used to be used really well in politics, and I admired it, and we've all experienced people could truly frame problems and own the agenda. 
And many of you may be studying this too. If you're working in the world of debate, there's this, all you have to do is Google agenda setting theory. And there's this whole notion of how you can get into the brain by framing the problem in such a way that you must have the answer. So the point of view starts with that story, but that's not the whole uh, uh, story, I guess, around a point of view. It's just one piece of it. The second piece is a point of view has to make you feel a certain way. There's a famous saying, nobody will ever remember what you say, but they'll always remember how you feel. So we recognize these logos. One Southwest Airlines, the other is United. So raise your hand if you think Southwest Airlines has a point of view. A lot of hands are up. So how do you know? Because you feel it. <laughs> they like you. <laughs> they don't hate you for flying with them. Right? You could do things like change your flight or maybe take a bag with you and not get charged. Right? They smile. <laughs> you can feel welcome in their, uh, in, their, uh, in their category and in their, uh, in their brand. They have a point of view. And you could argue whether the flights are a little bit cheaper. Right? That's the better wars. They're not going to get you there any faster. But that's why they have unfair competitive advantage over companies like United. They have a point of view. It makes you feel a certain way. Apple versus Microsoft, same thing. I was in the Apple store on a Monday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. There was still a big line up to the Genius Bar, and people looked like they were having a good time standing in line in an Apple store. And then you, it was, I think it was in the, um, in the Stanford Mall, and then you look across, right across, there's that empty Microsoft store. All those guys wearing T-shirts, kind of wondering what happened. It's different. Point of view versus better products. There's also characters, right? Larry Ellison, you can have your own opinions, but everybody knows Larry Ellison. He was an Oprah Winfrey. There's a book written about Larry Ellison that said that the, the title of the book was The Difference Between God and Larry Ellison. God doesn't think he's Larry Ellison. That's a famous category designer right there, right? Mark Benioff, when he started, he was nuts. He was hanging around with the Dalai Lama. Everybody thought he was nuts. There's no way you can have a no software software agenda. Impossible. But yet now he's a philanthropic uh, uh, leader, a visionary. He brings a lot of good to this world. So these characters are part of the point of view, too. And when you think about these companies, this big idea you have, these tech insights, think about the whole story that would be told about you. Because this is where Al mentioned these companies and categories live inside your head. Create, create a story. Stick it in that head. Right? Create the, you know, your, your co-founders, your founders, the, the, comp the people we admire. They're all part of the same act. And of course, we mentioned this before, but the ultimate point of view that we admire the most is uh, the no software software agenda that uh, Mark Benioff launched. It's absurd to think that you can have, tell the world no software when you're a software company. But it's kind of hard to compete with, especially if you're on-premise on uh, on software. So the last piece we want to talk about is this notion of a lightning strike. How do you know you're involved or on the back end or in the targets of a category designer? You're going to feel it. They hit the world with something called a lightning strike. And these lightning strikes are purposely built to move the mind, to condition the mind, to set the anchors, to convince you that the purchase you made it was a great position, to convince you that there's a king and you need to run towards that king and, and follow, all the, follow the crowd. It's on purpose. They target you, they hit you, and they influence every influencer around you. And every time you see a TechCrunch article, or every time you read a big profile in Fortune magazine, or you start to hear about the big buzz around these companies, I don't know if they're all doing it on purpose, but there is a fair number of these category designers are out there purposely targeting you to make you excited about their point of view, their story, their, their products, their uh, tech insights. This is a little bit inside baseball, but... I would say once you get into these bigger companies or even a small a startup that starts to grow, what happens is companies start to form silos, these functional silos, sales, marketing, products, channels. They operate independently of each other. We've all worked with those companies where the salesperson is selling something and the marketing teams are marketing something and the CEO is saying something completely different on the earnings call. Well, lightning strikes are used by category designers to align the company for one and one campaign one and one point of view, one 
visionary statement. And we see it all the time. You just might not realize these are lightning strikes. And they are. DockerCon, if you're in the app world, you know DockerCon. They're pulling everybody in. They're enlisting people to join their cause. It's almost religious. Has anybody went to one of their events? It's quite a, it's quite a performance they put on. A lot of respect for these guys. Um, virtual reality, you know, I think Mark Zuckerberg did his best Oprah Winfrey and handed out the, the uh, VR kits and it literally forced people to see what he could see through the virtual reality kits. And then uh, has anybody been in San, San Francisco during Salesforce or Dreamforce? Right? You, you can't, it's not that much fun, right? Try to get a hotel. Right, yeah, yeah, there's this hotel, I remember, it was right across the street from me, it's usually like $99, you wouldn't even go in there, and it's like 750 bucks a night during Dreamforce, and they had such capacity, they brought in a cruise ship and parked it off the Embarcadero, <laughs> right, and again, there was this feeling of, remember the group think? When you see 150,000 people come in to Dreamforce to listen to Mark Benioff and the entire ecosystem speak about the future of cloud, that's the king, and that's on purpose. So maybe, you know, again, some of the thoughts we had around this journey is if you're at a Dreamforce or if you're at a big conference or if you see that news or you read about that PR or maybe you're just Ubering around in an Uber, maybe this would give you a different lens on the world, might give you a different way to look at, your, uh, look at the world as it's all these categories that are around us. Or, more importantly, if you have that big tech insight or if you have that big market insight, these are some tools that you could use to apply to making sure people understand what you see. And then the last thing is, you know, Al and I would like to join, you know, invite you to join us on our category design journey. Um, if you liked or are interested to hear more about anything that we just talked about, there's about 230 pages coming out on this in a book that's being released on uh, June 14th. And we'd love it if you grabbed it, took a read, and send us an email, let us know what you think. Uh, so with that, Al, come on up. Uh, love to, oh yeah. Yeah, just one thing on this. The, I showed you the three musketeers photo with me, Chris, and Dave. There's one other musketeer. His name's Kevin Maney. He's a Newsweek writer, and actually Kevin was the one who helped us write this. So on that point, let's, uh, let's have some questions. I bet there's some questions in this room. So put your hand up. We'll try and get a mic to you, and we'll try and repeat the questions for the folks who are looking from the web. Tina. Well, I'll start off. Um, oh. So do you are in a category one who designs it in order to win it? Or can there be a category that's designed by someone else and you come in and uh, eat their lunch? Right. Um, a lot of examples of both, actually. Uh, we always believe... Sorry. Oh, sorry, the question is, if you're in a category, do you need to be the person who designed it to win it? And um, our short answer is yes. If you're in an existing category, fighting for market share and market cap, and you didn't invent it, you better ask yourself who did. <laughs> Somebody else created that category. But what actually happens a lot, and I don't know if you, you remember the earlier days of uh, social business when companies like Jive and Yammer were coming out, they're pretty hot companies. One went public, one got acquired by uh, Microsoft for over a billion dollars. They paved the road for companies like Slack and Atlassian, who are now taking all their work and turning it into, and probably monetizing even a bigger category around whatever it ends up being called, collaboration. So there's a lot of steps in the road, this journey we talked about. But uh, I think the most important takeaway is if you didn't design it, you should ask yourself who did, and then maybe start to look at the bigger picture and say, is the problem we're solving the full category, or is it one piece of a bigger problem? So that's how we look at it. Any other questions? What are yes, some of the new categories that you are seeing emerge right now? What are some of the new categories you're seeing emerge right now? Um, there's literally dozens of them. Uh, we, we meet with probably 40 or 50 companies each year. Um, the one I think that's most topical, and we actually talked about this in one of the other Stanford uh, courses, is this question of what's the front office now. Uh, and it's an incredible battle that's unfolding. You've got Dropbox in one particular case, which is, if you like, the file system. You've got Slack, which is the, the, the company that's redefining how we work as a team. Collaboration, Atlassian's another one specifically targeting the technology. We think that the front office is being redefined in front of us right now, and it's a giant, it's a giant battle that's happening. And uh, the, some of the players are Google with all of the G Drive and the, the Google Docs. Um, Microsoft obviously has three companies in that space, including Skype and, and uh, their, uh, their, their file sharing system. So that's one that's a really hot one. 
Uh, another one as a sort of a super category is big data in and of itself. We showed you the slide with big data, for example. There's about 40 categories in that sort of super category that are unfolding right now. And the way that big data and certainly the vertical applications of using big data is another one. Another one we talked about in a recent newsletter is, is machine learning and some of the applications of machine learning. And one, one company that we work with, actually Stanford students who graduated last year, a company called Clear Metal, Metal, if I can say it as an American. Um, and Clear Metal are sort of revolutionizing how shipping happens and shipping containers. And so that's a vertical application of machine learning. We've got another company in the HR space that's doing so, the same thing. But it, it's, it, you know, a, as you see in all of these charts, there's just this you know, incredible explosion. And what normally happens, in, as we said in that category in, in the model, is it starts out with product market fit. A dozen companies start to get into the fight and ultimately the, the, the category definition and the things you expect from that category to deliver become clear somewhere in that sort of two to four year range. And then one of those companies becomes that thought leader and ultimately rides off with all the money. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question. If you're a new company and um, you have some things happening, you have customers, things like that, so you would make maybe press releases to get known. Would you, from that lightning strike point of view, would you hold off on that until you had like a whole handful of them? And so the question was, if you're a young company and you're wanting to communicate to the world through press releases or whatever else, how does the lightning strike model apply to that? I think Dave's the master of that, so why don't you answer? <laughs> I don't know if I'm the master. I, I think the answer is uh, in the earliest stages of a company, uh, there's a lot of work to be done to get what they call product market fit. We've probably all heard that before. And there's a lot of iterations, a lot of, a lot of ideas, a lot of problems that we're testing, use cases you're testing with customers. And as well as adopt, you know, growing your company, right? That company design happens a lot too. And I, I think it's very fair to let that take its due course and operate uh, and, and learn and not necessarily declare you have the answer if you don't absolutely know you have that problem pegged, you know exactly how your tech or market insight solves that problem. Uh, because sometimes if you go out a little too early, you might set the table for somebody else. Um, but again, you kind of go back to that, that balance on that triangle. That's why that triangle matters so much. Um, so I don't know if there's a magic rule at what time, but any time you feel like you really have seen the same use case come through and the same problem being solved with your technology, it's a pretty good indication you probably have at least cornered uh, a thought on what to call that category and what to name it. And I just point to the company Clear Metal as an example. Yeah. You know, these, these three guys out of a garage basically came up with this machine learning algorithm to figure out where to put shipping containers. And so that early, and they're talking to in that particular case in enterprise, we definitely helped them with category design and bedded it into the product and the company as it was evolving. So that it is absolutely something you should be doing in the early days. It will inform how your press release sounds. It'll inform what yep. your website looks like. In their particular case, we coined a sort of a soft toss at the category called predictive logistics. We're not quite sure if that's the right name for it just yet, but you know they're out evangelizing that, and if it spins from there, then we think they'll get there. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, really insightful. So I'm curious, what kind of category do you belong to, and how did you design such a category? Well, so the question was, uh, what kind of category do we belong to, and how did we design it? Um, do you want to tell that story, Dave? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> uh, the category that we belong to and we're designing is category design. And um, there's a longer story. And it's, uh, it started for me 20 years ago uh, because we always looked at solving um, marketing at the time problems differently through point of views and lightning strikes. But it didn't really coalesce into the full kind of discipline until the last probably five years. And that's where we did all the research and we started realizing all of our gut you know, operator instinct. You know, when we were athletes on the field, had a pattern. It was kind of on a sad day, it's like, wow, I do the same thing in every company I've ever worked for. <laughs> on a good day is, wow, this is a play that we don't see a lot of other companies running. And so there's a pretty long story in there, but a lot of it came from our operator days. And then certainly the research and then the three years it took us to get all that out of our heads and into our blueprint in our playbook, uh, got, it, got it codified and locked up. So I don't know what your answer, version of that is, but uh, that's, that's mine. That's so, good. There's a bunch yeah. of other questions here. Yes, sir. How did the three of you meet, and more importantly, how did your relationship come to this 
um, three of you creating this company and being able to work together. How did the three of us meet and how did the company come together? It's a great story. So um, I was the CMO of a company called Macromedia. Put your hands up if you've heard of Macromedia in the audience. All right. And that's good. Well, I was the CMO at that company and Dave and Christopher, uh, the two other founders of Play Bigger, were actually marketing consultants to Macromedia at the time. And that's how we got to know each other. And we created this uh, category called Rich Internet Applications. Uh, it got co-opted by pretty much every major company in the tech space out there. And we had a point of view called Experience Matters, that great experience is a great business. And if you as a designer or a developer are delivering a great experience, it's going to be a good thing for your customers. So that's how it sort of all started. We all went off in our own directions, as, you know, as always happens in business. And then I, 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 we then sold Macromedia to Adobe. Dave and Chris were doing something inside Mercury Interactive. Dave then spun out and was the CMO somewhere. Net net of it is we came back together about five, actually over five years ago now, and uh, we decided that there was a lot here that we had, you know, in our gut and intuition that needed to come out. And we had to put this, what we now call category design, we did not call it category design back then, into play. And we decided that we put a company together called Play Bigger, and ultimately that's, that's, what we, that, that's how it all started. Any other questions from the floor? Great. Well, this was totally inspiring and very educational. Please join me in my welcoming. Thank you. Thank you so much.